Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Jay Moran, mayor of the great town of Manchester, Connecticut, home of Scan Optics. Thank you, Jeff. For it's, uh, we just got a great tour of, uh, of what goes on in this facility. And, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Jeff Missile, uh, Mi uh, Melissa, right? Yes, and Shannon for your work and all the staff here, uh, and especially your front end staff. We got to see all the real workers on the front end today doing the hard work and, and what we do to digitize. Here in the state of Connecticut, and Governor always coming to you for things, but you, Manchester is doing things for you for the state of Connecticut here, so we're yeah. proud of that. And uh, it's just a great opportunity. But Scan Optics has been here since the 80s. It's a great part of our community here on Progress Drive. Um, I'm joined today by Senator Cassano, Steve Cassano, Representative Jeff Luxemburg, and Representative Jeff uh, uh, Jason Doucette. And we're happy to be here with, uh, with uh, the Governor to, to just really see the, the great progress that's being made in here on digitizing. Uh, records, important um, uh, in securing records and making sure and everything is safe in the digital world in the state of Connecticut. And uh, here to tell you more about that is Jeff Mitchell, who's the CEO of Scan Optics in the, in the town of Manchester, Connecticut. Jeff, thank you. Thank you. There you go, Jeff. Appreciate it. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's a thrill for me to welcome the governor and his staff and, and uh, all the dignitaries today. We're, we're very proud of the relationship we have with the state of Connecticut and the impact we are making in a private-public partnership uh, on a daily basis for the state of Connecticut residents. This past 12 months, you know, we're a global company. We deal with government agencies around the world, and I have not seen an effort that's more uh, efficient and well-run than we've had under government, uh, Governor Lamont's leadership and leadership of of Commissioner Jabel in terms of the HR centralization project. 19 state agencies were centralized. Uh, the staff members of those 19 state agencies in conjunction with our staff did just an incredible job at consolidating data. We, we took 12.4 million images, 4.4 uh, million documents, classified, digitized, and now that information is available online and accessible uh, for state employees. The workflows, the automated processes, the way people operate, all part of the governor's mandate is much more efficient than it ever was. You know, we've been serving the state of Connecticut for a number of years. We've processed si over 62 million images, impacting 12 million Connecticut residents um, on a you know, daily basis in terms of the Department of Social Services, and applications for social welfare. So we're thrilled with that. And we've dealt with uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, Children and Families, uh, Department of Revenue Services, and the list goes on. Again, the private-public partnership uh, and the innovation and in using technology and best practices uh, and working with the government has really been a thrill for us. So uh, I want to commend the governor again and thank him so much for coming and, and thrilled to have all you here. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Commissioner Josh Javel. Great. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, we really appreciate uh, the work of you and your team. Uh, you're incredibly important partners uh, to the state and everything that we're trying to do. Uh, under the governor's leadership, um, which uh, he set the direction early on that one of the real priorities for this administration was going to be to modernize how we operate state government. And part of that modernization uh, means uh, not having our information locked up in filing cabinets, uh, very hard to access, uh, particularly during a pandemic when people are working from home. And what that means is we need to transform how we do things. And with the support of Scan Optics and the team here, we've been undertaking a number of important initiatives. The one most recently completed, and probably the most substantial one, is the digitizing of all of our state um, HR files, all of our personnel files, which this team, and Jeff just gave you the statistics, they literally took boxes upon boxes, scanned them all, put them all up in the cloud. And why does that matter? Um, well, it matters for a number of reasons. First of all, in some of our state office buildings, you might be horrified to know that we use about 30% of our square footage for filing cabinets. So uh, we can reclaim that space and save a lot of money on our real estate footprint. Um, also, it's a key enabler for us to be able to implement our new uh, PeopleDoc system, which is our online system where employees can access everything having to do with HR. So instead of having to fill out paper forms and go see the HR department when you want to change your address or change your direct deposit or have access to your personnel file for whatever reason, 
Now you can do that yourself on your own time from your pajamas at home in real time. And so that's uh, a service that our employees really like. And then it also helps free up a lot of time from our HR team, which is really important because they've got their hands full right now, both in terms of um, hiring, right? We're hiring record numbers of people right now as we face a significant wave of retirement and deal with um, you know, key skill areas that we need to, to bridge those gaps. But also it's, it gives our employees better careers, right? People don't like shuffling paper around. <laughs> we want to use their skills to be able to focus on those really hard to recruit jobs. And this is just an HR example. These examples exist across state government. And so what we're really focused on is really digitizing and putting online for a self-service model a lot of these very kind of basic manual tasks that give not just our own employees, but also the citizens of Connecticut the ability to self-service transactions online whenever they want so that our employees can focus on the higher value activities that really make a difference. And then of course, the punchline on all of this is that it helps us save money too. It helps reduce the cost structure of state government, which means less risk of you know, future tax increases, more of our resources being able to be used for the services that really make a difference in people's lives as opposed to shuffling paper around our offices. So we're really excited about the progress we've made here. Um, we cannot do it ourselves because our teams have to run the state while all this transformation is going on. And so we're so uh, dependent on great partners like Scan Optics. We're very grateful for all the wonderful work that's done right here in Connecticut. And so thank you for, for all of your efforts and thanks for having us today. And uh, now it's my honor to uh, introduce the driving force behind all this modernization work, uh, Governor Lamont. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, actually, the driving force is the guy that used to work at IBM and is now Chief Operating <laughs> Officer for the state. But I appreciate the good words. And uh, Jeff, to you and all the folks at Scan Optics, uh, I just wanted to tell people why it's really, really important. Uh, you know, scanning documents seems nice. Uh, how does that impact me? Well, first of all, what you see back there, that's going away. That's going the way of the dodo. That's going extinct. And uh, that means um, everything's going to be online and digital. So as Josh said, first of all, that means, uh, look, I get elected. I'm walking around, um, you know, DAS and DSS, and I see just acre upon acre of file cabinets. Well, that's going away. So that obviously compresses our footprint uh, a lot. And more importantly, when you go from paper to microfilm, we sort of aren't really in microfilm yet, over to digital, it's searchable. And that's really important. That means all of a sudden the documents are alive. You can work on them. It's shareable. One of the things the chief operating officer tries to do is make sure that um, our different departments can work in collaboration. Now they can share that information in real time and find exactly what they need to find on a timely basis. That means the work that uh, our state employees are doing is so much more meaningful, so much more impactful, much better customer service um, for folks in need. I was, uh, Jeff sort of struck when we went to the person who was uh, scanning a lot of um, information on SNAP benefits, uh, formerly known as food stamps. And uh, she pointed out that um, in the old days, just a few years ago, uh, we were 48th in the country when it came to how long it took us to process your request for SNAP benefits. Uh, and now based upon time timeliness, how fast we can get that turned around and available to you so you can get the food support you need, we're now second in the country. And that's uh, thanks to Scan Optics. And that's what it means, I, I think, in terms of what we're trying to do in state government, to make it leaner, make it more efficient, save you money, but in particular, special focus on the customers we serve. When I come out of the business world, I like to think of every taxpayer and every person going in for a SNAP benefit. They're our customers, and the customers are always right, and we're trying to do better for you. And that's what Scan Optics is doing every day. Thanks. Great question. You, if you've walked around the building, you'll notice that there's camera systems everywhere where we've gone through all the NIST compliance protocols. Uh, we have a secure FTP protocol. 
um, pipeline essentially of all the data that goes directly to the state. Uh, and the people that are working on highly secure information are partitioned into specific rooms where no one else has access. There's no windows into those rooms. So security is of utmost importance to us and to each one of our clients. Are you the only company so far doing this with the state? I believe you went to another statement so far. Is this the only company or do you anticipate more companies coming on board doing this type of thing? Yeah, well, look, when we undertook this project on HR centralization, we did an RFP, and, uh, and ScanUp is one, and we were thrilled because it's a Connecticut-based company right here doing great work with some of our other state agencies. Um, so they're, they're a major partner of ours. I'm not sure if there, there are others doing similar work. So the modernization bill, um, which the key provision, which was relevant to this project, that enabled all of our state agencies to do everything online, to basically remove some statutory requirements that actually existed that said you have to do this via snail mail or in-person transactions, got rid of all of that. That had to do with all state statutes. Um, I think in some cases it had benefits for municipalities as well. Maybe the mayor can comment on that. Um, but wherever they, we come into um, uh, issues or regulations or statutes that create barriers, we bring them to our partners. We have tremendous bipartisan support from our legislative colleagues to tackle these issues where they come up, and you saw that in the, in the modernization bill last year with PASH, but overwhelming bipartisan support. Mayor, I don't know if you have something like this in your basement. Um, do you usually have to send up a list? To well, if they've been following Manchester, they've had a lot of water in their basement. That's all <laughs> we've had in the basement here last year. Yeah, I mean, similar to the state, we have many files and records on, and, uh, 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 well, and what's very impressive in the back room is you see these big, they roll out these big parchment papers, these old plans that uh, the state or most towns don't know what to do anymore. And this company like Scanoptics has taken those, and you know, these are, these are, these are, some of these are close to 100 years old, they're falling apart. So we're gonna be working them ourselves, ourselves. We have the same problem with files, um, and our town halls are a lot smaller for file cabinets than the state buildings. So obviously we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're looking at moderniza modernization there too. Sounds like you can preserve a lot of these documents. Absolutely. Anything else on this, just before we? Yeah, one, one final question. Yeah. Um, how are you thinking about the alignment with the law that's been, the law changes eventually? Um, any idea about how to connect with major modern buildings on the Connecticut Sure, uh, how long do you have? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, we, we have um, dozens of projects going on across the state right now. Um, common themes are, are what I described before, moving transactions online. We want, governor set out the goal in his first state of the state address that we want to be the first all digital government. So enabling citizens and businesses to do every interaction they have with the state online on their own time. That's a lot of work. We have a lot of very old systems in the state, but we're chopping away at it. And you've seen a lot of progress at DMV where we've started to pilot a lot of these initiatives with our business one stop. And in the coming months, uh, you'll see a lot more progress with other health and human services, transactions, interactions, increasingly moving online giving people that kind of online modern experience that we expect when we're shopping online or banking online. So that's really a, a major focus for us. Um, and then, you know, using that technology and that self-service to really streamline and, and make the operations of state government much more efficient, recognizing, you know, the financial constraints that the state has in the future as well. So we need an extension of the uh, emergency orders because that allows me to put in place executive orders which we need to keep you safe. Um, I welcome legislative input on each of those executive orders. So the first thing that Chief of Staff Paul Mounds is trying to do is trying to get at least the legislative leaders, the gang of six together, so we can come up with a process for that. That, that you know, that takes some time. If the legislature's in session, they can opine as well. Um, but most importantly, we want them, the legislature, legislative leaders, the gang of six, to be able to weigh in. If we have to do something on booster shots, if we have something on child vaccines as they come along, make sure they can opine thumbs up, thumbs down within, say, 72 hours so we can keep you safe on a timely basis. So we had, in July, we had 11 executive orders that 
was funded. Since that time, um, I think we've narrowed that a little bit. We'd like to see in the legislature, or at least the legislative leadership, you know, vote on them, uh, make sure that they stay in place uh, longer. If they don't vote on it, you know, it would go into effect at least for another 90 days. What would that change? Oh, uh, President Biden's, uh, I mean, we have right now, as you know, I've put in place a mandate for state employees, for example. Right. We put in place uh, for nurses and healthcare workers. And President Biden's uh, mandate for um, companies like Scan Optics, which has already got all their folks uh, vaccinated, thank you very much, would probably be part of that same uh, EO process. Mass is something that you wanted in place for September 30th. Do you have any um, plans to change that, extend that? Uh, my instinct is it should be extended a little bit longer for uh, those kids who cannot be vaccinated in school. I think uh, that allows our schools to stay open, unlike what you see going on in some other states. So that would be one of the executive orders we'd like to see the legislature, at least the legislative leadership, uh, ratify and continue. Are there any others right now that you think are just as important as the extending of the day that you would like to see in those executive orders that you think are important? I think mainly the... Um, the masking, the vaccination protocols, the next generation of vaccinations, how we get that done, starting with state employees, starting with healthcare workers, um, vaccinations for people in nursing homes, patients as well as the nurses there. Or, um, so I think those are the things that are really important from a public safety point of view for a little bit longer. So the, the vaccine mandate is something that, your vaccine mandate, the state mask vaccine mandate is something that you would want to extend? Yes. I don't think so. Um, obviously, the legislature is in session starting in January. They could have uh, vetoed any one of the orders they wanted to, and uh, they elected to keep each and every one of them in place. We've worked in close collaboration. Collaboration. We've stayed in close contact along the way. So I'd like to think that we're all rowing in the same direction. But uh, I think it's important that uh, the leadership, anyway, have a chance to weigh in, and they're going to have that opportunity. Well, how long has it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm open to their ideas. I think probably uh, February 1 makes some sense, or March 1, give them a little bit of time to um, figure out how we want to proceed. And I've tried to use the executive powers very narrowly related to COVID and public health, and I think that's given them some confidence that we're not going to abuse this uh, authority. In other, in other words, run this, run this upcoming extension until the next legislative session so that they want to come back again in a herky-jerky fashion? Uh, that would be my recommendation. Uh, let's see what the leadership says. But again, we've got the uh, legislative leadership on both sides of the aisle. They're able to meet those six within, say, 72 hours. So no EO goes into effect until they've had a chance to weigh in. If they don't choose to weigh in, then the EO goes into effect. Uh, what about the, the vaccine passport idea? I mean, is that something that should be legislated, or is that something that you want to do through an executive order? Uh, I think it's a little easier to do it by executive order. Um, look, Josh is working with our neighboring states. You know, you go to a restaurant in New York, you go to a restaurant in Massachusetts. They all have different ways they want to authenticate to show that you've been vaccinated or not. Let's do this. So one system is a platform that works for everybody. Um, and frankly, um, it's something I've heard from the employers as well. They like an easier way to verify that folks are uh, vaccinated or for an employee to ver you know, be able to show that they have been vaccinated. So I think it's something we should be looking at. We haven't made a final call on it, though. When will you make a final call? I mean, you have to know. have your emergency powers extended before. When will we make the not final not call? Not necessarily. I mean, this is, this is technology that's off the shelf. We might be able to provide that you know, additional set of digital tools to show our vaccine credential. I'm not sure that would need an executive order. Governor, um, last week, I'm going to do anything I can to make sure our kids can get to school. Uh, we've got one particular school district where there are a number of um, school bus drivers that are in quarantine right now. Those kids are having a hard time getting to school. So we're going to stand up and do anything we can to support them. What does that look like? What are some of the things? Well, again, working, you know, talking to a Massachusetts, they've made available the guard, as you pointed out. 
Uh, you know, I know that Josh has worked really hard with DMV to make sure that everybody can get the license. There's no backlog in licenses. Talking to retired school bus drivers, see who we can get back, give them an extra bonus to come back. Our kids are in school. I mean, I was noticing, you know, the New York papers today saying, yippee, our kids are getting back to school for the first time in a year. Our kids got to school a year ago, and I'm going to make sure they can stay in school this year. I haven't done that personally, but I think we should. Also, one other, one other point, some Republicans have been concerned about crime lately. What are, what are your views on this latest incident in Marlboro that's a little uh, unusual, to say the least? Um, uh, what are the state police doing on that, or local police, or what are your views Wh on which, that? Which case is, is that? The Marlboro uh, kidnapping, for lack of a better term, yeah, uh, where they ended up in uh, abduction, kidnapping, whatever you want to call it. I think the most important thing, A, let's see how getting people back to school. That makes a difference. Get them off the street. We had a lot of high school age kids who uh, haven't been in school for a long time. Number two, we're getting the money out to the social service agencies so they can reach out to young people, those at risk, and head them off. Those that are maybe a first offender, make sure that they just don't go home, but they come in place with some of the supports they need. And for those chronic repeat offenders, um, we now have in place a way that a judge knows that. So if that kid steals a car and they come to Manchester and they get picked up here, that judge, before he says you go home or you go to a, a you know, residential facility, uh, we're going to know whether that's a repeat offender and where that person ought to go to keep our community safe. I think that's a good place to start, but I'm looking forward to hearing the legislature if they have some other very specific things they'd like us to look at. I think um, I'd like to see something done by the end of this month, uh, but I want to make sure what we do, we do it right. Uh, and Christina, as I said before, you know me, if I can do it on a regional basis, I think it makes a lot of sense. So we're talking to Massachusetts and New York as well. Is the, those off the shelf type of uh, vaccine passport program something that Connecticut would employ and then? I think so. Do you want to speak to that, Josh? Sure. And just to be clear, I wouldn't necessarily call it a passport. What we're talking about is giving an individual an easier digital to, you know, tool to, to show that they've been vaccinated, right? So right now, most of us have pictures on our, eye, of our phones of our, of our actual vaccine card, and when needed, we pull up the photo and we show it to people. If you lose that, uh, your credential, you can go on the DPH website, as I think you were the other night, uh, and you can get a PDF uh, verification. So that's, you know, that's meeting most of the need, but we can do it in a more elegant fashion too. And the, the concept right now is using your digital wallet. So creating a digital credential that is verified by the state public health department that then can go in your wallet, like your credit card or your, your digital wallet on your phone, right? So like your credit card or tickets to a sporting event or whatever, so that when prompted, you can pull up that digital credential. It'll have a QR code on it that could be scanned by this off the shelf technology that a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, apps that have been developed now to do this scan the QR code, the, the facility could see that that's a valid vaccination record, and off you go. So or in like the, being verified. It's exactly like being verified. So it's not a passport, and it would all be voluntary. If you don't want to participate in this, you don't have to, but a lot of people might want the you know, additional convenience of having that loaded in your wallet rather than having to go fish around for the photo that you took back in April when you got vaccinated. So that's the concept. And so it'd be voluntary, it might be helpful, but you know, in the context of like the, the new OSHA rules from the president, um, you know, employees will have to furnish that credential to their employer uh, if, that, if that is how it is rolled out. So it's just another easier way. We're not going to be providing, the state doesn't provide that information directly to employers. That's not our role. That information is the uh, property of the individual, right, whether they were vaccinated. Um, and so it's up to them to share that. It's just an easier way to share that information. Do you think that's going to become more important because we're seeing so many false documentation and people kind of yeah, it's more secure. It's a more secure, uh, harder to forge um, form of documentation. Um, so that, that helps. Um, uh, and that's, that's, that is one of the benefits of it. Can you put a name on the Democratic candidate, Donald Trump? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to have a great mayor. We're going to find out who it is in about 12 hours. <laughs> can, they, can that person beat Bobby Valentine? They got some great candidates for mayor down in Stanford. I'll tell you that Bobby V's a pretty um, big name, and 
uh, in Stanford. I understand that. Um, Caroline and David Martin have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about uh, the future of their city and how to uh, get people back to work. So it would be a good race. Can I um, transition on that? Bobby Valentine, chief supporter of Sports Day, maybe the sports back. And can you give us an update on, on what's happening with playing Center Mall with the, the casino? There might be some on-site uh, sports betting. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, we spent 10 years getting to sports betting. Uh, we just got the... Um, BIA Bureau of Indian Affairs approval about five days ago, and everybody's saying, hurry up, let's go. Um, we're getting there, and um, we got to put in place the DCP consumer protection regulations. But to your point, yes, there's going to be sports betting at the casinos on site at the reservations any day. And that's something they can do under their sovereign powers, and those uh, they've been granted that by BIA. For us to do it more broadly online, I think it's going to probably take another two or three weeks just to finalize things. I want to get it right, but I think we're ready to go. Well, A, that's true um, across the board here in the state government. But when it comes to uh, corrections, um, folks, um, we really appreciate what they've done every day showing up during the pandemic. Um, as you know, we've um, got fewer people um, incarcerated today than we've had at any time in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. We've been able to uh, consolidate uh, some of the correctional facilities. That means we've got uh, correctional officers that were someplace now to be able to fill in as needed going forward. So. I think we're going to be okay, at least for the near term. Hey, thanks, everybody.